In this lecture, we're going to focus on how to write and develop genograms. Uh, now, a couple of key points. First of all, genograms, again, are used in both mental health settings and substance abuse settings, but they're especially valuable in substance abuse settings because they're going to show us throughout a family history uh, trends that have existed and that have possibly related to your client developing a substance abuse problem. Another key thing uh, in relation to this specific presentation, there are a variety of ways to do genograms. There are a variety of languages, if you want to call it that, uh, different symbols that can be used. So what I'm showing you in this presentation is one specific way to do genograms. And I'm going to give you very specific symbols that I want you to use in the development of your family's genogram. Now, if you take another course uh, with another professor in the future, they may use different symbols to represent some of the dynamics that we're going to discuss in this lecture. Uh, they may use different symbols to uh, represent those things. And that's okay. Each kind of uh, class that you take or each kind of school of genograms is going to have some variation in the symbolization that is used. However, for the purposes of this assignment, these are the symbols that I want you to use. So what exactly is a genogram? A genogram is a family map. It's, it's basically like a fancy family tree. Uh, and what this family tree, this family map does is it depicts how family members are related to one another, just like a family tree would. However, it goes a step further than a genealogy tree. Because in a genogram, what we're really focusing on is what is the emotional atmosphere that is present in the family. So in a genogram, we're not just going to show how people are related to one another, but we're also going to show what the quality of those relationships are, whether there has been physical, sexual, emotional abuse in the family. We're going to take a look at um, history of addiction and mental illness in the family. So it allows us to get a better idea of what kind of conflicts have existed in the family. And then also it's going to give us hopefully a good idea of what kind of environment our client was raised in and how that environment possibly influenced their behaviors. Generally, a genogram is completed earlier in treatment. It's a part of the assessment process, and it's completed earlier in treatment because we would like to know up front how the client's environment growing up, how their family of origin issues have shaped who they have become. Now, for the purposes of this assignment, you are going to depict three generations on your genogram. Uh, some genograms have more generations, but generally speaking, the rule of thumb is that you utilize three generations on a genogram. As specified in the syllabus, there's two different ways to complete the genogram map assignment. If you have children, again, we're depicting three generations, right? So if you have children, you're going to depict your parents' generation, your generation, and your children's generation. Don't need to do your grandparents. If your children are grown, they have their own children, you don't need to depict that. It's just your parents, your generation, and your children's generation. And on your map, you're going to want to pick, depict your parents' marriages and relationships that they have had that have produced children. So previous marriages or uh, other relationships that they have had without a marriage that have produced any children. You'll want to depict that uh, in relation to your parents. For yourself, you'll want to depict your marriages and relationships that you have had that have produced children. And your siblings, you want to depict their marriages and relationships that have produced children. If you do not have children, you're still going to do three generations on your genogram map. You're going to depict your grandparents, your parents, and your generation. So you're going to depict your marriages, your parents' marriages and relationships that have produced children. You're going to depict your marriages and the marriages of your siblings, but you're not going to depict your own children or your siblings' children because that's a whole other generation and we're just dealing with three generations. For your parents' generation, you'll want to depict your biological aunts and uncles, but you do not have to depict their marriages or relationships that have produced children. Let's start off with the basic symbols. Everyone on your genogram map is going to have a shape associated with them. If they are a heterosexual male, they'll have a square. If they're a heterosexual female, they will be represented by a circle. 
Now you can see at the bottom we have some other scenarios, other situations in which we will change the shapes that are being used. If you have in your genogram a gay male, a homosexual male, you would still use the square to designate male, but then in the square you'll put a triangle, and the triangle is the geometrical shape that's oftentimes associated with the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered population. So a gay male would have a square with a triangle in the middle. Similarly, a lesbian female would have a circle, circle denoting female, with the triangle in the middle, which denotes, again, being gay or lesbian. If you have someone in your genogram map that is transgendered, transgendered, and they have gone from being a man to a woman, so they were born a male, they had sex reassignment surgery, and they're now a female, you would put as the larger shape the circle to denote female, and then inside of that you would put the square to denote that they were once male. And then conversely, if someone in your genogram map was born as a woman, and they had sex reassignment surgery, um, or they're living as a man, you would do the same thing. You would put the square on the outside as the larger shape to indicate maleness, and then on the inside you would put the circle to designate that at one point in time they were female. So every person on your genogram map is going to have a shape associated with them. They're also going to have some other information in relation to their shape. In the top left hand corner outside of the shape you want to put the person's name. So we see in this example we put John Senior. So in the top left hand corner outside of the shape we put the person's name. In the middle of the shape for individuals that are still alive, we put their current age. How old are they today? Now, in conducting your genogram, uh, you may kind of find out that there is an uncle that you haven't had contact with and that uh, your family doesn't talk about much, and you're not quite sure how old he is or how old your aunt is or how old some uh, family figure is. That's okay. Just estimate as best you can. Every shape uh, should have an age in the middle. We'll talk about how we handle it when someone has died, when someone has passed away already. We'll talk about that in a couple of slides. But for everyone that is alive, they should have in the middle of their shape the age that they currently are. And again, estimate if you have to. Uh, even if you just put something along the lines of mid-40s, that's fine. Just have something in there to designate how old uh, the person is around about. Now, the age goes in the middle of the shape. In the bottom left hand corner, outside of the shape, we're going to denote whether or not a person has a current substance abuse problem, is in recovery from chemical dependency, or has a history of or current mental health issue. If someone is currently abusing, not just they socially use alcohol, but if someone is currently abusing alcohol, we would give them a CD. You can see the uh, key over to the right side of this slide. A CD. CD stands for Chemical Dependency Issue. So if someone in your genogram map is currently abusing drugs or alcohol, you would put a CD in the bottom left hand corner outside of their shape. If someone is in recovery, from chemical dependency. So they used to be an alcoholic, but they've been clean and sober for uh, two years. You would put a uh, backslash R in the left hand corner outside of the shape, as you can see designated uh, for John Sr. in this example. Now, if someone currently has a mental health issue or has had a mental health issue in the past, you're going to put an MH in the bottom left hand corner. Now let's qu clarify very quickly um, CD versus backslash R. Someone on your genogram map will not have, will not have CD and backslash R uh, at the same time. It's an either or proposition. So even if you've had someone that used to abuse cocaine uh, and they haven't used cocaine in 20 years but they're now abusing alcohol, then we would still give them the CD because they have a current substance abuse problem. They're abusing alcohol. Um, on the other hand, if someone used to have a cocaine problem they haven't used in 20 years and they socially are using alcohol now but it's not to the level of abuse or dependency, then we would not give them a CD. We would instead give them the back slash R. So the CD and backslash R is an either or proposition. Uh, a person on your genogram map will not have both of those. 
let's talk about how we denote relationship status on the genogram. So the top left hand corner, how do we denote that people are married? Well, first of all, whenever we have a relationship, uh, we want to put the male figure to the left and the female figure to the right. So you can see in all four of these situations, marriage, divorce, marital separation, and cohabitation, the male is to the left and the female is to the right. Now, with a married situation, if someone is currently married to another individual, we're going to have a straight line that extends out from the middle of the shape, forms kind of an L, moves over to the other shape, and then comes straight up. So you can see, for example, with the marriage, there's a straight solid line that comes down from the square, 90 degree angle, over to the circle area, and then goes up to the middle of the circle. When we see a solid line like that, that indicates marriage. Now what we want to do is over on the left hand corner, you can see where it says M period 1999. In the left hand corner, inside that relationship line, we want to put the year that those individuals got married. So for these uh, two people that we're looking at under the marriage example, they were married in 1999 and, as we'll see with the other examples, um, we know that they're still married. They're still married. Now if you move over to the top right hand example, divorce. Now you can see the lines are the same. It's solid lines extending down from the square over to the circle. In the uh, left hand corner inside the relationship line we have M99, so that indicates that they were married in 1999. However, you can see in the middle of that relationship line, there are two backslashes in the middle of that relationship line. And when we see those backslashes, that means that the individuals are divorced. They are currently divorced. So two backslashes in the middle of the relationship line indicates divorce. And in the bottom right hand corner, you can see we have what? D period 2004. So we put D period for divorce and then 2004 if the couple has gotten divorced. The bottom left hand corner you see an example for marital separation. Now you see again solid line extending down from the square over to uh, the circle. In the bottom left hand corner inside the line we see M period 1999 so that lets us know that they got married in 1999. Now if you look at the middle of the relationship line there's a single backslash, single back, backslash. This indicates that the couple is separated. So they're still legally married to each other, but they are separated, meaning that they're probably no longer in an intimate relationship, most likely probably no longer living with each other, but haven't actually filed for divorce yet. In the bottom right hand corner you can see S 2003. S period stands for separated. We can see that they separated in 2003. Now, if a couple got separated and then later divorced, we would only put the divorced double backslash lines through the relationship line. So we wouldn't put separated and divorced if a couple had experienced that, we would put divorce. So when you're writing out your genogram, if someone has been divorced, just use the two backslashes with the D and then the year. If they are currently separated but they have not yet gotten divorced, then you would not have to put the double backslash. You would just put the single backslash as you see in the bottom left hand corner example and then the S and the year that they were separated. Now all the way over to the right you can see that we have a dotted line instead of a solid line and the dotted line indicates that these are two people that were in an intimate relationship, a sexual relationship that was not a marriage. So if someone was dating someone else, if they were cohabitating, living together, um, if an individual had an affair or they had just a, a general relationship but they were not married, we would use a dotted line to connect the two shapes. So you can see the dotted line coming down from the square over to the circle and up. Now with a cohabitation affair, just regular dating, intimate relationship, we do not put the years that they started dating. We don't put the years that they stopped dating. We don't put years for cohabitation. We only put years for marriage, divorce, and marital separation. 
Okay, so we know how to denote uh, marriages, cohabitation, separation, and divorces. What if someone has been married multiple times or has had multiple relationships? Let's take a look at this example. Let's assume that uh, your parents are currently married, are still married, and you were born of their marriage, but they had previous marriages. Well, we can see right in the middle of this diagram, we have what? The square, the circle, solid line attaching the two. So solid line indicates married and we know that they're married because we can see in the bottom left hand corner of that relationship we see what m period 1991 so we know that they were married in 1991 we don't see any backslashes in their relationship line so that indicates that they are still married now they've both been previously married so let's take a look at how we denote these previous marriages so Let's focus on the left side first. The husband, your father in this instance, uh, his oldest marriage goes all the way to the left. So if we look all the way to the left of this uh, diagram, we can see that we have what? A circle, a solid line coming down, and a solid line coming over. Solid line indicates marriage. And we know that they were married because in the bottom left-hand corner of that relationship line, we see M period 1982. So we know that they were married in 1982. Now there's a double backslash through that line. Double backslash indicates divorce. So in the bottom right-hand corner of that relationship line, we see D period 1986. So we know that that man and that woman were divorced in 1986. Now, if you look at this second to the left circle, his second marriage is right there. And we know that it's a marriage because it's a solid line coming down, connecting the two shapes. We have that they were married in 1987 because we see in the bottom left-hand corner, M period 1987, double backslash indicates they are married. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, D period 1988, they were divorced in 1988. Now we can see your mom's uh, previous relationship in this example as well. So if we look at the central circle figure and we go all the way over to the right, her oldest marriage is going to be depicted to the rightmost fashion. So you can see that there is the square over there, a solid relationship line coming down. We know that they were married because it's a solid line. We have M period 1983. They were married in 1983. We see the double backslash through the middle of that relationship line. And then D 1985 in the bottom right hand corner. They were divorced in 1985. And we can see that your mom's most recent other marriage was to another man. They were married in 1986. Double backslash through. They are currently divorced and they were divorced in 1991. So this is how we would depict uh, previous marriages in a relationship. Okay, so let's say that your parents are no longer married and they've remarried or they've had other relationships that have resulted in children. How do we depict that? Well, we're gonna start off with your mom and your dad in the middle of the relationship line. So we can see this central figure, we've got uh, to the left of middle, we've got that square, that's your dad. To the right of middle, we've got that circle, that's your mom. We see solid lines connecting the two, which indicates marriage. And we see in the bottom left-hand corner of their relationship line, we've got M period 1988, they were married in 1988, double backslash, which means they're divorced. And then in the bottom right-hand corner of that relationship line, we've got 1996. Now, if your dad has remarried or your dad was in another relationship, we're going to put his current relationship, his current marriage, right to the left of him. So you can see right to the left of the central square, we see a circle, a solid line coming down, M2000, that's your dad's current wife. They were married in 2000. Now let's say that your dad was married prior to your mom. We're going to put his oldest relationships over to the left. So prior to your mom, he was married to another woman. They got married in 1982. They divorced in 1986. And we see the double backslash in that leftmost relationship to denote that. Now, let's say your mom has remarried. We can see a solid relationship line coming down, connecting her to the rightmost, uh, to her right uh, square. 
and we see M2007. So we can see that your mom got remarried. She got remarried in 2007. No backslashes. Uh, so she's currently married to that individual. If your mom had been married to another person prior to your dad, again, we would put the oldest marriages, the oldest relationships over to the right. So we can see that she had a, a marriage prior to your father. They were married in 1980 uh, and divorced in 1987. So what about relationships that ended with death and widowhood? Well, this is how we would denote widowhood in our genogram. So we can see a solid relationship line between this square and the circle. However, in the middle of that relationship line, we see what? An X. That X indicates that the relationship ended with one of the partners dying. So we can see in the bottom left-hand corner of that relationship line, we have M period 1972. They were married in 1972. X through the line indicates that there was a widowhood, that one of the partners died. And then in the bottom right-hand corner of that relationship line, we put W period 2006. That's the year that the individual um, was widowed, that the relationship ended by death. So W period 2006, we know that one of the partners died in 2006. Now, how do we know which individual died? For every person on your genogram map that has passed away, and take a look at the husband in this scenario, see how he has a giant X through his shape. That indicates that he is deceased, that he is no longer alive. Now you can see slightly above the X we put the number, the age that that individual was at the time of their death. Now again, just like we were talking about with current ages, if you're not exactly sure how old someone was when they died, just estimate as best you can. You don't have to be uh, totally exact. Just do the best that you can with it. So um, if they were in their 60s, you can put 60s, or you can just arbitrarily say 62, 63, whatever the case may be. The gentleman in this example died at the age of 68. Now, to the top right-hand side of his shape, we're going to put the year that he died, and he died in 2006. Good rule of thumb, the year that that person died should match up with the W that you have in the bottom right-hand corner of the relationship line. Um, so at W2006, that would indicate that the woman was widowed in 2006. Well, in this instance, the guy died in 2006. So they match up with each other. Now, if you have um, a relationship that ended in divorce, and then one of the individuals passed away thereafter, we wouldn't have widowed uh, listed. We wouldn't have that W2006 in the relationship line. We would have the year that they were divorced because we don't consider ourselves widowed after we've already divorced someone. So for every person that is deceased, you should have the X through their shape, the age at their time of death, and then in the top right-hand corner, you should have the year that they died. Now, obviously, remember, we talked previously, top left-hand corner outside of the shape, you're still going to have that person's name, and then in the bottom left-hand corner outside of the shape, you're still going to have whether they're in recovery from substance abuse, currently abusing substances, or currently or has a history of uh, mental health problems. Now we know how to indicate relationships. Let's show how to indicate children or offspring. So let's take a look at the example at the top of this slide. So we have the husband on the left. We have the wife on the right. We have a solid line, so we know that they are married. Now if you look off of their relationship line, we have these solid lines coming down. You can see the first one comes down into a square. The second one comes down into a circle, third into a square, fourth into a circle. These are the children of that relationship. So that is their mom and uh, father that are being depicted in that relationship line. Now if you look at the sequencing of those shapes, the oldest child goes over to the left, the youngest child goes over to the right. So we know that that first square, that's the oldest child. That second shape from the left, that circle is the second oldest child, the second square is the third oldest child, and then the second circle is the youngest child. So the oldest children go to the left, youngest to the right. Now those are solid lines coming off, so we know that those are biological children. Those are their two biological parents.
If we have a child that is either a foster child or is an adopted child, look in the bottom left hand corner of this slide, the example that says foster or adopted. You can see we have mom, we have dad, solid relationship line, they're married, but then look at the line coming down to their daughter. It's dotted and it's dotted because that indicates that that daughter is either an adopted child or is a foster child that they have been caring for. For twins, we have a designation that is utilized for twins. So if they're fraternal twins, meaning that they are twins but they're not identical twins, we have one uh, entry point off of the relationship and it forms almost a V connecting to the two uh, shapes, the two children. So you can see in this example the V connects fraternal twins that are both girls, so they're sisters. If you have twins in your genogram map that are identical twins, you almost have a completed triangle there. So you have the V coming off of the relationship line, but then there's also a line that connects the two. And that triangle lets us know that they are identical twins. So every person that is born to a relationship should have a solid line or a dotted line or that um, V shape coming off of the top. Let's talk about some other circumstances having to do with children or offspring. If a woman has carried a child uh, to term, if she actually goes into labor and she gives birth to the child, but the child is stillborn, the child was never really alive, we still designate that on the genogram map. You can take a look at the two children depicted from this relationship to the leftmost side. If it's a stillborn child and it's a girl, we have the circle because that indicates that the uh, child is female and then we have an X through the middle. We don't put an age because the child unfortunately never really had an age. They were born stillborn. Similarly, if it's a stillbirth and it's a boy, we use the square because square indicates maleness with an X through the middle. Again, we don't have to put a age there because the child was born unfortunately uh, not living. If uh, in the relationship it has resulted in either an abortion or a miscarriage, you can see we still have the solid line coming down, but then we don't even have a shape associated with that child. We just put an X to designate that it was either an abortion or a miscarriage. And then uh, coming off of the relationship all the way to the right, you can see that there's a line coming down and there is a triangle. Triangle in and of itself represents pregnancy pregnancy now for a child that has not been born yet all we're going to use is the triangle we're not going to put a triangle into a, uh, a circle or a triangle into a square because then you're denoting that the child is either a gay male or a lesbian female and the child hasn't even been born yet so you don't know what their sexual orientation is going to be so for a child that has not been born yet we have the solid line coming off of that relationship that produced it and we have a triangle that is there now Obviously, we have these different sorts of circumstances that, uh, especially the first three, uh, that can be somewhat traumatic. If this is something, uh, the stillbirth or abortion miscarriage is something that's important in understanding um, your tale, your upbringing, the story of your family, obviously this is something that you can talk more about in your um, paper that accompanies your genogram map. Relationship quality is another characteristic that you are supposed to denote on your genogram map. So between you and the members of your family, chances are that you're going to have some symbols that are going to indicate what the quality of your relationship is with uh, various family members. Now, you don't have to have a relationship quality uh, signal between every shape on the map, between you and every person on the map, but for those significant relationships, uh, there should be some relationship qualities denoted. So let's briefly go over what the uh, different types of symbols we use. Top left hand corner you can see enmeshed. So if there are not clear boundaries between two individuals in the family, if uh, one person is codependent, if one person um, is constantly, uh, like we talked about in class, uh, a helicopter parent, we would say that they have that enmeshed relationship quality. There's too much togetherness, there's not enough individuality. So what we would do is we would take three straight solid lines and we would connect them from the shape of one person 
to the shape of another person. For individuals that have poor or conflictual relationship quality, we would take almost those kind of, they look like little mountain tops. We would take those half triangles and we would connect it from one shape to the other shape. And we'll take a look at some examples uh, to illustrate that. If a person is estranged from or cut off from another person, we would use that designation down in the bottom left hand corner. So if someone uh, hasn't spoken to a family member in two or three years because they had some sort of argument or some sort of blow up, they're probably estranged from each other. They no longer have contact. So we would take the solid line from one person and we would connect it uh, with the little kind of cut off mark in the middle uh, to the other person that they are estranged or cut off from. Uh, for an individual that has uh, an enmeshed but also conflictual relationship, we're going to combine the enmeshed and poor conflictual. So we're going to uh, take the three solid lines, but we're also going to put those half triangles in the middle of it. And again, we're going to connect the two shapes in that way. If an individual is close, they have a quality relationship with another person, we're going to have two solid lines, not three, because that's a mesh, two, that's going to indicate closeness. And if the person has a distant relationship with another individual, so it's not necessarily that they're cut off, that they're estranged, that they don't, don't talk to each other anymore, but they're just not really close, they, they don't really connect emotionally, we're going to have that dotted line that connects the two. So again, not everyone on your genogram is going to have these lines associated with them, but especially for you and, and your family of origin, the people that are closest to you, um, we should probably see some of these relationship qualities uh, denoted on your genogram map. And also keep in mind that one of the things that you're going to do when you write your paper is you're going to describe for me in your paper why these relationship qualities were depicted on the map. So explain to me why uh, two people are enmeshed in your opinion, why they're poor conflictual, why they're estranged, cut off, so on, so on, and so on. We also want to depict on the genogram assignment types of abuse that have occurred. Now to denote physical abuse, what we do is we draw a straight line towards the victim. If you take a look at the top, the physical abuse example, we see that the line starts at the square and it points to the circle. The arrow always points to the victim, the receiver of the abuse. So in this scenario we can see that the male is the abuser and the female is the victim, is the survivor. Now to denote physical abuse we take that line, that solid line, and we put little half triangles on the bottom and top. So you can see how there's kind of little V's coming off of the top of the line, little V's coming off of the bottom of the line. That lets us know that we're talking about physical abuse. Down at the bottom, sexual abuse. You can see that instead of being a straight line, we have those kind of mountain peaks, almost like it's conflictual. However, at the end, what do we have? We have an arrow pointing towards the victim. So we would know, if this was depicted on a genogram, we would know that we're talking about sexual abuse and not a conflictual relationship because at the end of those half triangles, what do we have? We have an arrow, and an arrow always designates that some type of abuse is being um, committed or has been committed. That's the other thing about this is this does not have to be current abuse that is taking place. It can also be abuse that has been conducted in the past. That arrow always indicates abuse. Now, I'll reiterate what I had said at the, the very first night of class. You are the keeper of your story, so you share what you feel comfortable in sharing. Your genogram map and your paper is kept confidential. I am the only person that sees it. So if this is something you feel comfortable in sharing and talking about, um, please feel free to do that. If it's not something you feel comfortable talking about, that's fine too. Again, you determine what you feel uh, capable and willing to share in your paper. And just like with the relationship quality, if you depict physical abuse, sexual abuse on your map, please discuss that, explain that a little bit. You don't have to give all the details, but just kind of describe why you put that there. Um, and then in the emotional processing of the genogram assignment, you can maybe talk a little bit about how denoting that on the paper impacted you. 
And the third type of abuse that is denoted on the genogram is emotional abuse. And you can see in this scenario, it again is the male uh, being abusive towards the female, the arrows pointing towards the victim, right? And you can see that this line, it is in a solid straight line, and it doesn't have those sharp curves, those mountain peaks like the sexual abuse does. Instead, with emotional abuse, we kind of have these wavy curved lines up and down, up and down, uh, very subtle, but distinct from sexual abuse. So that's how we denote emotional abuse on a genogram. Okay, so now that we have down the basic elements of the genogram, let's practice a little bit and let's see if you can develop a genogram for this uh, scenario. So Dave is a 46-year-old man who is married to 39-year-old Lori. They got married in 2000. They have two children, Tom, who's 11, and Samantha, who's 9. Dave is presenting to you for treatment for a substance abuse problem. When he's drunk, he's been physically aggressive towards the children, so physical abuse is taking place. Lori is currently in treatment for depression, mostly due to the stress she feels dealing with Dave's addiction. She's currently pregnant, which only adds to her current stress level. Lori seems to be codependent and enmeshed when it comes to Dave's drinking. She regularly tries to control it when he drinks and will make excuses when he is not able to make it into work after a heavy night of drinking. Now, given just this information, construct a genogram in which you have two generations. You have Dave and his wife Lori, and then you also have their two children, Tom and Samantha. Now, pay attention to some of the key information that's being given in this scenario. We're given the individual's ages. We can assume that Dave is a male, Lori is a female, Tom is a male, Samantha is a female. We see that Dave has a substance abuse problem. He has exhibited physical abuse. Lori has a mental health issue. She's depressed, and she's also currently pregnant. We also see that Dave and Lori were married in the year 2000, so they should have a married relationship line connecting the two. We also see some enmeshment there between Lori and Dave, so that speaks to relationship quality. So now what I want you to do is pause this video if needed. I want you to construct a genogram for Dave, Lori, and their children, and then what we'll take a look at on the next slide is whether or not uh, you are able to accurately depict their genogram situation. So pause the video and we'll come right back. So let's see how you did. So let's start off with Dave and Lori. They're married, right? So we have a solid relationship line connecting the two of them. Bottom left hand corner of that relationship line, what do we have? Married 2000. We know Dave is 46, so we have Dave to the top left of his square age 46 in the middle. We also know that he has a substance abuse problem, right? So CD to the bottom left-hand corner of his square. Lori, her name to the top left-hand corner outside of the circle. She's currently 39, so we put 39 in the middle of her circle. She's struggling with depression, right? So we put an MH in the bottom left-hand corner outside of her circle. Now, their children Tom's the oldest, right? Tom is 11, so we move Tom's square over to the left side. Tom in the top left-hand corner of the square, and then 11 in the middle to denote his age. Samantha is the second oldest, so Samantha outside of the circle, in the middle of the circle, age 9. And then Lori is currently pregnant, right? That would be the youngest child, so we have a solid line coming off with the triangle. That indicates pregnancy. Now let's take a look at relationship quality. We said that Lori was enmeshed with Dave. She kind of seems like the, the enabling type, right? So we have three solid lines connecting Dave and Lori. There are two shapes that denotes that there is enmeshment going on there. Now the previous slide also gave us a little bit of information about abuse. It said that Dave is abusive when he drinks and he's physically abusive. So what do we have? We have a line from Dave's square to Tom's square and Samantha's square. We can see that the line starts at Dave and the arrow points to Tom, points to Samantha, which indicates that Tom and Samantha are victims of abuse. We have the half triangles, the V's coming off of the solid line, and that lets us know that it's physical abuse that is taking place. So take a look at what's on the slide. Take a look at what you drew, what you wrote down, how accurate were you in depicting this family? 
So now that you've got two generations down, let's kick it up a notch. Let's add the third generation. And let's say that Dave is our identified client, so the third generation we're going to look at is his parents. So we're going to build off of the genogram that we had uh, in the previous slide that you already drew, and now we're going to add Dave's parents' information into it to complete the genogram, to make it a three-generation genogram. So let's say that we'll make it easy for you. Dave grew up an only child, doesn't have any siblings, okay? His parents were married in 1965. His father's name is Ted. Ted was an alcoholic, and Dave had a very conflictual relationship with him, although there was never any physical abuse. Ted passed away in 1995. He was 58 years of age when he passed away. Dave's mother, her name is Teresa, is currently 73 years old. She got remarried in 1997 to a man named Billy, and he is, Billy is, 75 years old currently. Teresa and Billy have a close, healthy relationship with Dave, so both of them have a healthy relationship with Dave. However, they're kind of concerned about his drinking. So let's take a look at what information we're getting in this uh, scenario. So we know that Dave's parents are Ted and Teresa. They were married in 1965. Ted was an alcoholic, had a conflictual relationship with Dave, but there was not any abuse, any physical abuse. Ted passed away in 1995. He was at the age of 58. Teresa was widowed at the time. So they were married. Teresa and Ted were married when Ted passed away. Teresa has since remarried. She got remarried in 1997. Her current husband's name is Billy, and Billy's 75 years old. So based on this information, add to the genogram that you already have, add that third generation in above Dave, Dave coming off of that relationship between Teresa and Ted, and let's see what we got. So pause, soak in this information, write down the third generation in the genogram, and let's see what it looks like. All right, so let's take a look at what we're looking at. It's a little jumbled, but we'll make sense of it. So you can see that we have one line connecting Dave to Ted and Teresa's marriage. It gets lost in between the closeness lines, but that's okay. You see one solid line coming off to Ted and Teresa's marriage. We know that Ted died in 1995, to, so to the top right of his square we have 1995 and X through his square, which indicates that he is deceased. He was 58 at the time of his death, so right above the X within the square we have the 58. Bottom left hand corner we've got the CD because he was an alcoholic, right? We can see the marriage between Ted and Teresa. They were married in 1965, so in the bottom left hand corner we've got M period 1965 and X through that relationship because uh, Ted was still married to Teresa when he passed away. And then a W 1995 in the bottom right hand corner of that relationship because Teresa was widowed in 1995. Teresa got remarried, so we see Billy depicted over to the right. Billy is 75. They got married in 1997, a solid relationship line between the two of them. Between Ted and Dave, we see the, uh, the mountain peaks, right? The half triangles between Ted and Dave. That represents conflictual relationship. Now, there's no arrow pointing towards Dave because an arrow would indicate abuse. So, no abuse took place, just a conflictual relationship, so that's what we have. And between Dave and Billy, and Dave and Teresa, what do we see? We see two solid lines, because they're close, but they're not enmeshed. So this is just one example of the genogram. You're obviously going to make this specific to your family and your circumstance. What I would encourage you to do is when you're drawing your genogram, take your time, take it one step at a time, and I would encourage you don't sit down and try to do this all at once. It's okay to gather all of the information all at once, but in terms of drawing your map, really plan it out and do a couple of sketches before you do your final draft. Uh, so the moral of the story is don't wait until the night before this assignment is due to try to sketch this out. This is a lot of information that we went through. You can always go back to various points of this video and re-watch them and, and listen to what we were talking about. And obviously I didn't answer all the questions that you will have about the genogram assignment. So if you have questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, stop by my office during office hours. Uh, talk to me before or after class and I can try to help you out with that as much as I can. With that said, thanks for listening, guys. Good luck on your genograms.